we go. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa salim. Welcome, welcome, welcome for tonight's session. Alhamdulillah, we have all four of our speakers that have arrived. Alhamdulillah, and so we'll, we'll get started. My request from before was that inshallah, if we can fill up the seats in the front, uh, that will be best inshallah. And the seats that are in the middle, that will be best inshallah. Jazakumullah khayran. How's everyone doing? We doing all right? Alhamdulillah. How was dinner? Dinner was okay? Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> We're about to get fed with some knowledge, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome, welcome. All righty. So as I call upon the shiuch, inshallah, I just uh, want us to uh, get ready for this. There will be a QR code for questions. No, it's going to be, okay, it's going to be open, inshallah. So we have Sheikh Abdul Wahab here. We have Sheikh Abdul Rahman. Please take uh, the stage. We have Sheikh Farhan. We have Sheikh Ahmed. Please join us on the stage. Jazakumullah khairan. And I will actually give it over to Mufti Abdul Wahab. Jazakumullah. Okay. Round of applause for Mahir, man. Mashallah. He's the only person that knows, like, he's the only person I know that knows, like, seven languages. Uh, mashallah, may Allah bless him, bless his family. A quick story about Maher. He actually came from Minnesota, um, and he landed, he got his rental, and um, mashallah, he, he's at the hotel right here, the Holiday Inn. Who's at the Holiday Inn? Avid. Yes, mashallah. One of the best hotels in the world. <laughs> um, so he's staying there. I don't want to scare you guys, but now I have to say the story. I've already committed. Um, and mashallah, he's parked his car there. And in the morning, our Fajr is like a the Hajjud time, mashallah, it's so early. Uh, at 6 a.m., he comes, and he's like, I have a problem. I said, what happened? He's like, I, I got carjacked. I said, wow. I mean, I didn't say wow like that, but like, I was like, oh, man. In the beginning, I thought he was joking. And I realized from the, his face that brother wasn't joking. It was real. I said, I said, your car actually got taken? Like, someone borrowed it, right? Like our slippers in the masjid? He's like, yeah, someone took my car. I was like, man, what do you have, like a charger or like a... He's like, no, Toyota Yaris. <laughs> I was like, someone took your Yaris? That means they really needed it. <laughs> Mashallah, Allah has blessed him. Today he's driving a Tesla. I know, Allah takes only to give back. Mashallah. He went all the way to Dearborn to pick up that Tesla. And in between, we have our boarding school. So we had an old Altima. He was like, I think I'd rather walk than using that Altima. Allah bless you, Mahir, for all your love and support. Jazakallah khair, Habibi. Mashallah, we have Sheikh Farhan, Sheikh Ahmed, California is here. Mufid Rahman is here, Mashallah. We're going to have a beautiful conversation. Who enjoyed yesterday's conversation? There you go. Got some love. Um, so, inshallah, today will be even more enjoyable. Sheikh Abdullah will join us as well. When he comes, I'm going to move away. Um, inshallah ta'ala. And today's conversation, uh, what do you guys want to talk about? Any topics in mind? Go ahead. Zakat. You want to give us some zakat? Please. Bismillah. Ahlan wa sahlan. Self-doubt. Okay. MashaAllah. Keep back in the house. MashaAllah. JazakAllah khair. Any other brothers? Huh? Again? Like yesterday? Ooh. That's, that's, that's going to get personal. You guys ready to get personal? Oh, there you go. He's Egyptian. <laughs> you know? He's not Egyptian. He's Pakistani, but he studied in Egypt, and he comes off like he's Egyptian. You know, like those daisies that look Arab? That's him, mashallah. Um, exactly. Yeah. He, 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 but he's not, though. That's my point. Yeah. <laughs> Get the tick, right? Uh, <laughs> any other topics? Yes, go ahead, Habibi. Okay, mashallah. How to get, teach people that are interested in Islam, mashallah. And you, um, so no clothing. Okay, great. MashaAllah. Go ahead. Sadqa Jariya. Okay, again, miftah.org slash donate. No, no, that's too much. That's too deep. And, you know, um, now, nah, sister. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. We'll leave that for, um, you know, Mufti Asim tomorrow for one of his classes, inshallah. That's good, that's good. Sorry? Fostering Muhabba. Okay, so, naam. Okay, 
Okay. And these guys are serious. This is serious. Now I'm so what we had in mind, as I'll tell you what we had in mind. No, but so what's again? Okay, go. Cool. Sorry, these guys from England, mashallah, brother from England. Bismillah. Ah, uh, you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you, I'm just messing around. Of course, M and M, Maghrib and Miftah. As long as we're the first M. Allahu yeah. Akbar. Beautiful, good. beautiful, beautiful. That's a great sister from Columbus. <laughs> now I'm sister. That's, that's, that's powerful. But yeah, what do you want to talk about? Um, Any of those? Because we already have a topic in mind, but I wanted. To so, uh, how to deal with all those letters? LGBTQ, you know, that's a lot. <laughs> letters. Too many colors and letters. It's like I'm in math class and English class all over again. <laughs> now. That's just right. the, whole, the whole point of this conversation is to keep it light, refresh, you know, because you've been sitting in class all day. And I'm, I, when they told me we we're going to have a speaker's corner at night at 8.30, I thought no one's going to show up. I, I, He's I'm, underestimating us, guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like I, B I, for you guys, mashallah. Allah Akbar, man. And, and, I, and mashallah, seeing all of you, subhanAllah, is, is really refreshing. And so that's why we want you, you sat here with so much talab and interest. So we want to get your feedback on what you want us to speak about. I have, from what you said already, I, I already shortlisted it to two things. Go ahead, sister. Guys, this is your time to clap. <laughs> clap, clap. <laughs> Let's do it right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. Sheikh Billu already told us that we have to do that. No, no, no. Serious, serious. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you can ask them to do, but this is not allowed. Like, right. So we are planning something tomorrow night, inshallah, but um, we haven't figured out how to do it. So we can speak yeah. about that. We can speak about it. It's a great topic. So, uh, yeah, we'll yeah. see a few yeah, things about it, inshallah. inshallah. Yes, yeah, sister, one more. Khalas, oh, inshallah. Mufti al I think we should start with, I mean, this is because many of them have never seen Sheikh Farhan Zubairi before because he's like a khamul, he's a hidden gem. And, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and... Um, and, and, and many people haven't seen... It's my first time meeting Sheikh Ahmed in my life today. And, and it's my first time meeting Sheikh Farhan a few weeks ago. We were together in Pakistan for a few days. Oh, really? And he heard like these horror stories about me. And, um, they, they, all, they all came true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm worse than advertised, you know. When we sit together and, you know, we have, we're always like studying deep things and teaching. And so when we're together, we have like a good time. So he, he knew that the Wahid brothers have a good time, but he didn't realize it was a great time. So, oh, so I, and Alhamdulillah, so he was with me for a few days there. Spitting some facts, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and this brother right here, Sheikh Ahmad, like, so it's okay to get confused as brothers because what happened after Sheikh Abdul Aziz spoke today, one brother came up to me and said to me, Sheikh, you know, you're such an inspiration for our community. You're a scholar, you're a mufti, and you're a doctor. It's amazing. I said, thank you. All right. Then, okay, getting me confused with my brother, Mo Abdul Aziz, is not, okay, I understand where that comes from, even though I'm way more handsome than him. It's fine. <laughs> so this, that's, I understand where that comes from. But the second one, my brother, Sheikh Abdullah, is a blob, right? <laughs> right? And so, and so Sheikh Abdullah, is it recorded? Is <laughs> live? Live. Oh, sheesh. Yeah. You should have told me before we started. Because <laughs> usually we sit down and we just have a good time. So, Sheikh Abdullah, someone came up to him and said to him, you know, when you were speaking today, you sound like Dr. Zakir Naik. You were saying all these scientific facts and all these things. And Sheikh Abdullah was like, Jazakallah khair. <laughs> all right. Then Sheikh Ahmed met me today. And he said, I thought you were the youngest brother. 
And I said, how did you think I was the youngest brother? Come on, man. Because <laughs> that's the way Mufti Abdul Wahab and Sheikh Abdullah always bully me, make me do things. Oh, my like, God. Like, I'm here, Please. even though I don't want to be. He's playing the victim card now, guys. <laughs> you know so, how that is. So we, I think it's important we start off, we kick it off with Sheikh Farhan saying a few words about himself, his journey, because all of you are on a journey as well. And it's good to get some feedback from those who went on a journey, what they, how they studied. And we're still, it doesn't matter in our life, nobody, this journey doesn't end till our death. Mm. So no one can actually say, that I'm done my journey, right? It ends when you pass away. Should so Ahmed, same thing. So th th you want to speak about the knowledge journey? No, that that part of it, and the sister asked also like some advice you got I'm because they're also students. And the third thing, those that first one, second one, and the third thing which three of them said, and I think it's very important in this setting because people that are here at the knowledge retreat are coming from different backgrounds, different places, right? And what happens in our communities is like we come with our own people, like our four or five friends, and we stay with our four or five friends. The beauty of being in a gathering like this is that we develop relationships. We develop friendship. We develop love for each other. And so that, I think we should mention that at the end as well, like the importance of relationships, suhba, friendship, brotherhood, sisterhood in Islam, and where it stands. Because at the end of this knowledge retreat, yes, you should go back spiritually uplifted. You should go back with more knowledge, but you should also go back with more relationships. You know, you, you met people, and because what happens afterwards, it's like sometimes your spirituality can dip, but your friendship, if it keeps increasing, you keep pulling each other up, right? But it, and that's why it's important to have people on this journey with you, right? Um, Abu Bakr Siddiq, when he, was t when he told his son about learning knowledge, he told him that you need if you want to learn knowledge, you have to have a heart that is truthful in seeking knowledge. You have to have a teacher who loves you. So hopefully we love you. And third, you have to have companions who support you. Right? So companionship is important when you're, when you're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's hard. It's, we're an ummah. To be alone and do it is difficult. So let's hit all three things. We have 46 minutes. Let's start with Sheikh Farhan. Are you supposed to mediate this? Yes, you, you're supposed to answer questions. Okay, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, <laughs> they want to hear you talk. Because you, you've you come, you, he's come here, and he's just told everyone that they can never become scholars, and you're always students of knowledge. So now we want him to speak and open up, because, mashallah, there's too many etiquettes. Did you guys benefit from the etiquette class? Of course class? he did, man, mashallah. Mashallah, round of applause for that, guys. Mashallah. So he's not that serious, you know, mashallah. No, I, th I, I honestly thought, because some people, I, when after I did it, Mufti Abdul Harbs, I'm like, oh, it was good. I thought maybe it was too too much for you guys. No, and no, no. And I, not enough. Not so enough. forgive me, I offended you, right? Because, no, but you can drink all. coffee and water in my class, not like Dr. Haifa. I just, no, you can't do it. But if <laughs> so you're only here for 45 <laughs> minutes, don't do it, okay? It's not that long. Dr. Haifa almost gave me uh, a hard time in the morning, too. <laughs> just a little bit. And I had, to, I had to defend myself a little bit, guys, you know. I'm just messing around. Alhamdulillah. Shaykh Farhan, um, mashallah, everyone's journey that is here, I mean, your journey is different than Shaykh Ahmed. Shaykh Ahmed's journey is different than Mufti Sahib's journey. So inshallah, maybe you can start, based on what he was speaking about, that you had companionship within your circles. Yesterday, Imam Mikhail spoke about a brother named Tamir. That was his, you guys remember Tamir? Yeah. Okay, if you guys remember him, who was Ustad Majid's main guy? Abdullah. Abdullah. These were people that were hidden that became like their, their companions that helped him in his journey. So maybe you can hit that as well, inshallah. This is like a very open-ended question. It's open-ended, North open California. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ba'ad. Um, I don't know really where to start from, but my, my journey, alhamdulillah, has been very uh, interesting. Um, first and foremost, it has nothing to do with me as an individual. This is all tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I grew up like, you know, people when they look at me, they probably make assumptions of where I come from and my background, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, but growing up, I was just like your typical average Californian. You surf? Um, no, no surfing. <laughs> huh? I, I, was your, I was your typical suburban desi kid. So in the in the yeah, hold up, we'll get there. So so in the in the nineties, like, like mid nineties, late nineties, if you're a typical Daisy suburban kid, you have three influences life. There's Islam, 
there's hip hop, and there's basketball. Those are like the three like the three main things in your life. I think all three of you hold that in common, though. I'm just not hip hop. I mean, the first person you have to ask him when you saw the cop the first time, who do you make off for? Who'd you make off for? Who'd you make off for, Bajan? Tell him this is this is like this is unplugged. I'm not gonna say it. Tupac. Tupac. No. He's not that old. You know. First, when I first saw the Kaaba, the f- my dad told us that you have to work. Okay, by, by the way, I was very young at that time. So my dad said, he, he encouraged all of us brothers, like, you know, we got to be ready for this, the first sight of the Kaaba, whatever dua you make, Allah's going to accept. He's pumping us up. He said, but he's not going to tell us what dua to make. Whatever comes to your heart, you make that dua. So we, we go and we see the Kaaba. My dad's a very emotional person. You could hear him, cr- like, going crazy. And my mother's there. Then all of us, we see the Kaaba. Then we go to the corner. And my dad's one of those guys, like, he instantly wants to get, like, live reactions. You know those guys? Like, instant. Okay, so. The, the mic is right there. <laughs> like, right away. Okay, so how did you feel? Right? So what did you make dua for? And so my dad says, oh, chalo, what did you guys make dua for? So Sheikh Abdullah, you know, he's, mashallah, always been the smart guy. He said, I, I made dua that Allah accepts all my duas for the rest of my life. <laughs> okay? That's what he said. So he said, so then he asked, Dr. Haifa, I was just talking about you. <laughs> Were you here? <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> in a good way, Dr. Oh, no. In a good way, in a good way. In a good way, in a good way. So then, and then she's going to get mad. She's like, you know, are, are, do you have the same feeling around her? I get scared of her. <laughs> she's like, She's like, a, you know, like, I, she's like a teacher, you know, mashallah. So, um, so then my dad asked me, what dua did you make? And I said, Abuji, trust me, you don't want to hear my dua. <laughs> He's like, no, you know, better you have to tell me what dua you made. And I'm like, Abuji, trust me. So he was probably thinking I was making dua to marry a certain girl or something. And I was like nine years old. So I was like, I have to say something. So I said, you know, I made dua that Allah give hidayah to Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan. <laughs> The two, mic- the, two mic- the, two mic- the two two, two, two MJs. I say, oh Allah, give Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan hidayah. Y- 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 my dua, dad said, dua for Michael Jackson might have been accepted. It is, inshallah, and Michael might, Jordan might too, been. inshallah. And you know, my dad said in Urdu, he's like, "Tumne un do kaminon ka naam yaar laga." He's like, "You said those." Yeah, he said, "I don't know how to say kamina, but like he says, you said those t- you, wretched people's mm-hmm. names in this sacred place." <laughs> I, s- I said, I'm, I'm sorry. That's what came to my mind. Mufti Bob, that was a no, bad that, that question. Was, that was the three things. That's why. Sorry. <laughs> right, so, so three influences in life, right? Islam, hip-hop, and basketball. And they're, they're constantly competing for your attention. So as you grow older and you become a little more independent and free-thinking, especially in high school, sometimes those other influences become a lot more powerful. So as I was in high school, alhamdulillah, by chance, Uh, One of my friends introduced me to a weekend program. Um, It was a weekend program from Friday night till Sunday morning where a bunch of high schoolers would get together. We'd stay at someone's house, and we'd do like a weekend madrasa. And this weekend madrasa was established by Sheikh Nu'aman Beg. And and Sheikh Nu'aman, he's actually the founder, the director. He's the brains behind IOK, the Institute of Knowledge. But you will never see him in public. He does not speak publicly, he doesn't give khutbahs, he doesn't give lectures, doesn't give durus. He's just a don, that's yeah, why. <laughs> <laughs> he just watches. You know. But mashallah, he, he is the one who uh, put this whole organization together and through the duas of his mother. So he said that when he, was, uh, when he had come back, he graduated in 97, and this was my freshman year in high school. Um, he came back and he did not want to be an imam, he didn't want to be like a religious director. He wanted to go into like a career, like a professional career. So he started consulting for Deloitte. So he would travel the whole week, and then on the weekends from Friday to Sunday, he'd dedicate us to this rowdy group of high school kids. So that played a really big role in keeping me in line. A lot of the garber (laughs) that happens in high school happens on the weekends, right? So having that program was really a means of protection, and he served as that mentor figure. Um, He was perhaps the first person of knowledge I met that we could relate to, right? He wasn't, he wasn't that much older than us. He was into basketball, right? He, he knew what was up. He would play with us. He'd have discussions with us. So that played a really, really big role. So when I got to college, um, my freshman year in college is when 9-11 happened. 
And there was a lot of social, political factors that took place. And after that, um, my first quarter, I decided to take a leave of absence from college. Uh, you can do that. You can take a leave of absence for however long you want, and you can come back and pick up right where you left off. So I took a leave of absence to finish my hifz. So throughout high school, on this weekend program, um, I was able to complete five ajza of the Qur'an, just on the weekends, uh, and with minimal effort. So he said that, why don't you just take a year off and go and finish it? So he sent me to Benoria, right? So I, I, myself, and a couple of other people, we went for about nine months, and we completed our hifz. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. And, and yes, this is, this is an American youngster. I mean, he's not young. I mean, I just, I just calculated your age, so you're not young. But uh, an American brother who finished his hifz in nine months. MashaAllah. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Allah. So when I was there, um, I was roommates. I was fortunate to be roommates with a person named Sheikh Tamim. I'm sure you guys know Sheikh Tamim. From the Bay Area. From the Bay Area. Mashallah. Sheikh Tamim and Mufti Nayef. You know Nayef? Yeah, yeah. He used to be here before, right, in Detroit. So they were both my roommates. So when I was memorizing, uh, every single evening they would sit down with me and they would just give me constant targhib, constant encouragement that you're here, you're memorizing the book of Allah, you're so fortunate, you're so lucky, but there's more to it. You have to understand what you're reciting, you have to understand what you're memorizing, you have to further your studies. So after those nine months, I was totally convinced. I was gung-ho, I was ready. I'm like, I'm going to stay here for, mashallah, six years. <laughs> so when I finished, I had this conversation with my mother. And I said, you know what, I'm going to stay. And she said, no, you're not. Because <laughs> my mom really, really wanted me to go to med school. <laughs> Just like any other typical Desi, mother, mashallah. So we had a lot of back and forth, a lot of conversation, a lot of dua. And finally, she just made this deal with me that as long as you finish school, you can do whatever you want. So I came back and I you know, re-enrolled at the university and I finished my school. And I think her hopes were that once I got back into university, I'd just like get back into it. But that kind of never happened. <laughs> So afterwards, alhamdulillah, after I finished my uh, studies, then I went to Egypt, where I was fortunate to be roommates with Sheikh Ahmed, mashallah. You guys know just since then? We've known each other oh, for a mashallah. Mashallah. alhamdulillah. And then afterwards, I went to Pakistan and studied, alhamdulillah. Why did you say Pakistan like Pakistan? Like Pakistan. in Egypt, you said Egypt, <laughs> like uh, Azhar, yeah. you know, and Pakistan, you know. No, I'm just messing around, Sheikh. Mashallah. It's rare, though, like someone that can go back to college, finish, and return. Isn't yeah. that rare, Sheikh? It is, and, and actually based off that, I would, I would recommend any student of knowledge who's serious to do either college first, right, get your college degree, um, even though you may not go into a professional career, it does give you certain skill sets that will be very beneficial in your dini studies, right, in terms of just like critical study, uh, critical thinking, organizing your thoughts, being able to present your ideas, uh, having time management and things like that, it's really, really beneficial. Or if not, at least after you're done with your studies. After you're done with your studies, at least go back and have that experience. And not just in terms of those skills, but it really gives you a feel for the, what's going on with the youth in the community. Right? If you want to be relevant, you want to be able to relate, you want to be able to help people, you have to be in the trenches with them. So being in that environment, it really exposes you to what? What's needed and it helps you kind of formulate your thoughts and your ideas. Inshallah, <laughs> Ahmed, maybe you can take it from there. And tell us what Sheikh Farhan was doing when he came to Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of cushiony. <laughs> By the way, what Sheikh Farhan didn't mention is that he's a girl dad. He's got, mashallah, four daughters. Mashallah. Mashallah. May Allah protect them and preserve them. Say ameen. Um, as Sheikh Abdul Wahab mentioned, you know, everyone's journey is different. Um, my father, from a very young age, he wanted me to memorize the Quran. It was like a passion of his that his son become a hafiz. And I kind of, because of him, developed that passion, right? Um, and what happened was, uh, you know, my father really wanted me to memorize the Qur'an. There weren't many options in, in North America at that time. This was the early 90s. And um, one of my close friends in the community that I lived in, uh, who was a year older than me, he was eight. His father had decided to send him to Pakistan to memorize the Qur'an. Uh, and when my father found out, he asked me, he said, do you want to go as well? And I being a seven-year-old, I said, yes. I said, yes. Um, and uh, my mother was obviously very hesitant. Um, it was just me and my sister. So, you know, 
not one child not being there for, you know, only Allah knows how long. But I said, you know what, dad wants me to go and, you know, he's cool with it. So my friend who's an eight-year-old and me who was seven in 1992, we got on a plane by ourselves without our parents. Um, it wasn't even that they, they took us, and I'm not like blaming them in any way, right? <laughs> no, I'm just like an eight-year-old and a seven-year-old got on a plane in LAX and flew to Pakistan. Um, and that's how my, my Hifza journey started. I, I lasted about a year. <laughs> um, I came back and I had memorized uh, seven ajza, right? Um, just, you know, because we're being open and loose. The reality of it is you know that many times the way Qur'an is taught back home, it's not perhaps the most ideal way, um, if you know what I'm talking about. But it was part of my journey. It's part of what Allah had decreed, right? My parents actually had no idea what was going on in, in terms of like the physical abuse and whatnot. My parents had no idea. Uh, <laughs> someone laughed. I don't know why. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Um, but when I got back... Is that, is that why you decided to get all jacked up? Is that, <laughs> was that what it was? <laughs> um, but when I got back, subhanAllah, I didn't say anything. Um, and my friend, he actually told his parents of what had happened. And then he called literally the night we landed. And then his father called my father and was like, hey, my son is saying this. And this is like our parents being reunited with us after 11 months. And my father gets off the phone and he's just like shocked, right? My parent, my, my father, my mother, they were like never raised a hand upon us. And my father gets off the phone and he asks me. And I didn't know how to respond. Like, yes, yes, it did what happened. And he's like, why didn't you ever tell us? And I didn't know. I didn't have an answer. I really didn't have an answer as a seven-year-old. I think I was eight by this point. And anyways, that happened. So I didn't end up going back. And alhamdulillah, by the grace, by the mercy of Allah, um, there were some obstacles because of what had happened, but uh, by the grace, by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I kind of restarted my memorization again. I was going to public school, and I was just in the afternoon, sorry, in the evenings going to, uh, you know, the local masjid, there was an imam there, right? And I would just memorize with him. Everyone else was learning to read. I was like the only student that was basically memorizing with him. And alhamdulillah, like my mother, she put in a lot of work day in, day out, on the weekends. Every day when I would wake up, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, the first thing would be review. Mm -hmm. She would listen to my review, right? Two to three hours, Saturday, Sunday morning, every single day when I would wake up, it would be review. Monday through Friday would be memorizing the new portions, right? Because I was doing school at the same time. Alhamdulillah, I finished, um, you know, at the age of 12. And alhamdulillah, I started leading taraweeh uh, by the age of 13. Um, so I was leading at a very, very young age, but I didn't understand a lick of Arabic. Like, not a word. Like, besides Allah and maybe, maybe Rasul, like, I did not understand anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it remained like this. You know, I went, to, I went to middle school, I went to high school, I went to public high school. Um, I didn't have a strong connection to the religion. My parents were Muslim. I would pray five times a day. Um, in Ramadan, every Ramadan would come and I would, you know, uh, I would lead with my teacher, I would lead taraweeh. But I didn't have like a strong connection to the religion. Um, didn't have a lot of Muslim friends in my area at all. Just literally like two or three in my high school, me and my sister were the only Muslims. Um, and then I think when I got to college, um, it was I think in my, my, my freshman year, my sophomore year, started hanging out, hanging around with the, some of the MSA individuals. For like my freshman year, I didn't hang around the MSA. I thought I was too cool for them. <laughs> I thought I was better than all of them. I was like, you know. But then I started hanging around them, and you know, they kind of slowly, slowly pulled me in. And I remember there was a specific Ramadan that came. At this point, I was still leading taraweeh, and now my teacher had moved on to another masjid. So I would, I would lead taraweeh, mm -hmm. and I would also, you know, do the witr at the end, and I would make dua out loud, you know, because... Not Hanafi. And, but, right, I didn't understand Arabic. I didn't understand Arabic, so how am I going to make dua, right? Like, what do I say? So I would listen to, to recordings of different, like, uh, Sheikh Shuraim, uh, Sheikh Mishari, and I would memorize the duas. Would you, would you memorize the cries, too, at the right time? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to ask about making dua for the king. <laughs> Sheikh Abdullah's job. But then I had I had a few friends that were exchange students that 
uh, at the school that I was going to. So I would memorize a dua, and then I would go to them, and I would recite it, and I would say, hey, tell me what this dua means, because I'm going to make it tonight. I want to know what it means. And that was like the first time I was actually learning Arabic, but it was like, it was kind of like bootleg learning. Like I was like memorizing the dua, and then I was like, hey, translate this for me. Okay, now I know what it means. Now I feel comfortable making it. And, you know, a few friends suggested to me, they said, why don't you go to Egypt and study Arabic? You have the Quran memorized. Just study Arabic. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So I kind of, you know, presented the idea to my, my parents. My father was cool with it. My mother was like, but I was like, but dad's cool with it. <laughs> she kind of looked at me like, well, how did that work out in 1992? <laughs> but, um, you know, alhamdulillah, I, I, was deci I decided to go. And Sheikh Farhan, I had known him for a couple years at that point. But it was more like uh, acquaintances. We would see each other. I'm going to be honest. Oh, no. Be honest? <laughs> yeah, be honest. Allah. I, I had just come back from madrasa, finished my hiv. I was in madrasa, like madrasa. I was like, look like them. Right? Hey, what's wrong with them, man? I'm, I'm, I'm oh, saying okay. I was fresh. Man. Was fresh. <laughs> and then I see him at the basketball court. It's like, hey, he's a hafif too. I'm like, him? <laughs> he nah. said, half of what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no. <"Nah." laughs> Straight up judged you. <laughs> yeah, I, but I, I judged I him judge, too. I judged I him. Judged I judged but him. I judged him too. Like, and that's why he said you're still that. judging us. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the, the judgment was mutual. <laughs> you know, so we like we were cordial with one another. We were nice and stuff. But, you know, there was mutual judgment. There was mutual judgment. Uh, but then one day, one day, Sheikh Farhan calls me. And he wasn't Sheikh Farhan at that point. Uh, but he calls me and he says, hey, I heard you're thinking of going to Egypt. And he's like, I'm going too. Why don't we be roommates? And subhanAllah, that was, I, I remember actually where that conversation happened. Um, and I was on my college campus, and I was like, oh, that's a great idea. That's a phenomenal idea. And he was going to go either like a month or two months before me. He's like, I'll get an apartment, you know, I'll save a bedroom in there for you. So subhanAllah, I went to Egypt uh, for six months, and the plan was to learn Arabic. Uh, one of the influences there, one of the, the people that kind of mentored us there is Sheikh Soheib Webb. Uh, he would kind of took us under his wing. You know, we were both huffal. He would take us around. He would say, hey, let's go pray here for Jumu'ah, right? Um, he would kind of, you know, uh, advise us and mentor us and whatnot. And three months in, I realized that, hey, I'm really enjoying this. I want to stay for longer. So I called, I called my parents. And I knew this wasn't going to go well, but I called my parents. And I, said, I told my dad, I said, hey, what if instead of six months, like, we make it a year? And my dad was like, okay, alhamdulillah. So, but he put a condition on me. He said that at the end of six months, <clears throat> I want you to return back to the States. Because you have a return ticket. Return back to the States, spend two weeks with us, and then we'll send you back. So I said, okay. So, you know, we begin looking for tickets as the six months is about to end. Because I'm going to go back. And then he's looking for tickets for me to go back on, to go back to Egypt. But the tickets are really expensive. So he says, Ahmed, I have an idea. So what's your idea? He says, how about you don't come back? And instead, the money that I was going to spend to basically buy that extra ticket for you, that, that money, I'll put it towards you going for Umrah in Ramadan. I said, okay, perfect. Alhamdulillah, let's do it. <laughs> no, let's do it. Um, so, subhanAllah, I stayed in Egypt, and then a few months later, Ramadan came around, and I was around other individuals from different states, from the UK that had come to study. And when they learned I was going for Umrah, they began to tell me and whisper in my ear, oh, you should apply to Medina University. And I was like, yeah. And they, but they kept saying it. So I was like, you know what? So every week I would call my mother and I would tell her, hey, can I have, uh, can I have my high school transcripts, right? The next week, because I didn't want to tell them. The next week I would call my mother and I would say, hey, can you just get a letter from a doctor saying I'm physically fit to study, you know? But I would never tell my mother this is what I'm planning to do. One week I called her and I asked her for something because you need a police report saying you have no criminal record. <laughs> and I don't. <clears throat> so, <laughs> <It's clear. laughs> uh, so she asked me, she says, she says, out of the blue, I've never said anything to her. She says, are you applying to Medina University? And I'm like, yes. She's like, okay, I was just asking. <laughs> and that was literally the end of the conversation. I was like, okay, I, like, I don't know where to take it from here. SubhanAllah, I got all my paperwork. I ended, up, I ended up going for Umrah. I spent the last 10 days in Mecca. And then after Eid, I went to Medina for a few days. Ended up applying. Um, <clears throat> in those days, if you applied in person, you took the interview in person, it raised your chances of getting accepted. So I did that. I went back to uh, Egypt for a few months. And then after that Egypt stay finished, I went back to the States for a bit. And I, you know, 
continued in college, uh, and then I remember <coughs> that towards the end of the semester, like I had the idea of going to Medina was getting further and further in my mind. I was like, you know, more into you know SoCal, mashallah, it's very beautiful mm -hmm. and you know, the scenery is very nice, mashallah, <laughs> <laughs> like Detroit. <laughs> That's the, we, we drove through Detroit today. We said, Alhamdulillah, we live in LA. <laughs> we said, I, I was telling Chef Orhan, I said, we, we drove, <laughs> mashallah, brother, uh, <laughs> Afan, he, he picked us up, he waited at the airport, and then, you know, mashallah, he was bringing us here, and, you know, we were, <laughs> Chef Orhan, we're looking out the window. <laughs> and I had to open Google Maps, because I was like, am I, am I in Afghanistan? <laughs> am I in Detroit, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I'm he's, sorry, I'm he's sorry. Totally judging. Afghanistan yourself. is very beautiful, yeah, but just, it, was, yeah, yeah. it was bad. So Egypt. <laughs> we, got, we, got, we got to the hotel. We got to the hotel. I looked at Chef Farhan and said, May Allah protect us from this earthquake and any earthquakes in California. Amen. But I said, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> but mashallah, you guys have a beautiful facility. <laughs> so I went back to the States and um, the semester had finished. And my mom had been uh, diagnosed with cancer, subhanAllah. And my, my sister was, um, she, she was doing school and she was like up north. My father was out of the country. So, you know, my mother, she has her surgery and whatnot. And she gets out of surgery. I, I get to the hospital and I see my mother in literally in the hospital bed. And I, I had just prayed Jumar, I come back to the hospital and I got very selfish. I did something very just like for myself in that moment. But it was well intentioned. I said, I said, mom, like you're in this situation. Can you make dua for me? And she said, what do, you want me, what do you want me to make dua for? And I said, I want you to make dua that I get accepted to Medina University. And she said, okay. Right? And subhanAllah, like within a week, uh, a brother who was already studying there, he, he called me and he said, hey, the list just came out and you, know, you got accepted. And you know, subhanAllah, when, 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 when I got accepted, there was some doubt, like, do you want to do this with your life? Is this what you want to do? And I remember telling Imam Suhaib uh, that, hey, you got accepted, but I'm not sure if I'm going to go. And I remember he was very stern with me. He was like, you don't have an option. Mm. You have to go. And he was like, if you don't go, I'm going to come to your house and kick you out. <laughs> he was very, very stern, right? I spoke to Shafi Asr Bridges, and he was like, no, you have to go. Alhamdulillah, you know, I decided to go. And alhamdulillah, there was trials and tribulations like everyone else's journey. But alhamdulillah, it was one of the best decisions of my life. MashaAllah. Round of applause, Shaykh Ahmed, MashaAllah. <laughs> So with that, inshallah. Just really quickly, Sheikh Suhaib, he actually played a big influence, man. Yeah. Like when we're in Egypt, he like really like played that role of a mentor wow. and guiding us through our studies. And he, he introduced us to two works, which I believe are like essential reading for every single student of knowledge that will really like open your horizons. One of them is Adab al by Sheikh Muhammad Awana. And the other is called Risala al ulfa mm. There's a little Risala written by Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. And Sheikh Abdul Fatah, he did a, uh, he edited it and he put footnotes on it. And those two things like really like broadened the horizons. And then I remember he, 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 he found out that both of us wanted like study lifetime. So I think before we were leaving, he took us to the graves of all the great mashaykh that are buried there. Wow. He said, these are the works you're going to be studying. You should go pay respect. <coughs> Al-Shafi'i. Al-Shafi'i, uh, Al-Jazari. Yes. He took us to all these like maqamat and just like these are, you're going to be reading their books. You should like go pay respects. Wow, man. Round of applause Imam Suhaib, mashallah, man. If I, if I can add to that, um, as like my freshman year in, in college, I, I didn't feel like a close connection to the religion. I was, you know, alhamdulillah, I was praying, I was leading taraweeh. And I remember there was a conference that happened in the winter of maybe like 2004 in, in Southern California. Uh, I think it was ISNA used to do like a West Zone Regional Conference. And... Um, I didn't know of Imam Suhaib at that point. He was already popular for the people that were, you know, like going to conferences. But I remember a friend of mine, uh, subhanAllah, it was the same friend that I went to Pakistan with at the age of eight. He called me and he said, hey, there's this really good speaker coming to, to this conference. Why don't you come check it out? And I came and I checked it out. And that was the first lecture I ever heard by Imam Suhaib. It was like end of 2004, maybe even end of 2003. And I remember sitting there and he blew my mind. And it was the first time I was like, man, like this, this is what I've been searching for my whole life. Wow. This is what I've been looking for my whole life. And that was almost, almost uh, two decades ago, subhanAllah. Oh, Allah, man. <coughs> Allah bless our elders. I mean, um, I mean. So now, inshallah, turn towards my brother, inshallah. Um, maybe, Mustafa, you can share your journey as well. I don't know where you want to start from, but inshallah, some aspects that people can benefit as well. And you can share your insights that a lot of 
mothers and fathers and even older siblings can benefit from, inshallah. And as he's responding, I'm going to get off the stage and Sheikh Abdullah is going to no, come sit. Yeah, that's it. After. Still. <laughs> so, Rahim. So, I mean, many times your journeys like are pretty similar. So, I'm going to subtract the similar similarities between the three of us because in, this, in the journey of knowledge, you have parents, you have this, you have that. So, as I was sitting here, I was just trying to think like, what make and there's always that, that there's always that aspect in your journey which may be different than others as well. And um, uh, this one's heavy. I think that my journey is very straightforward. It's my older brother. Amen. You know, he was I was probably seven, eight years old and he went to a boarding school and I was missing him. You know, I can't live alone. And uh, and I, was, I heard he was became half of And I said, you know, I, told, I kept on talking about dad. I said, I want to go to the same school as him. He said, no, no, you're good, you know. I remember him telling me he was bad in school and you're good at school. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't think he told me that, but I just understood that. <laughs> and... Uh, and then I kept on bugging him. I said, you know, I want to be with Bajan. I want to be with Bajan. I don't want to be home, you know. And uh, well, you had younger brothers too, though. Man. Like, I, oh, <laughs> like, this is like an awakening for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, really. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I ever said this before. So I, my students were sitting here too, so I'll, I'll say it. You know, you don't understand the power of siblings. You know, there. if you're a sibling, don't be selfish. You know, if you have a brother, you have sisters... You know, you can impact them more than any speaker on the earth, right? Yes, it's the most difficult thing to do because you're always living together. you always, you know, and whenever someone thinks of miftah or a madrasa, I mean, first, like, in the first few, like, sentences or reflections, you're going to think of the Wahid brothers, right? The brothers. So we ask all of you to make dua that Allah keeps us together. Um, but nonetheless... It was my older brother, you know, and and uh, he he went to a boarding school, so I want to go. And I remember when the day I joined, he was bad at hips. Okay, he was in, he was a bad kid. But here's the thing about him, right? It doesn't matter if you're if you're bad, right? And if you're not doing good at something, you can still encourage someone else to be better than you. All right? The Prophet said many times people who listen are better than the ones who are speaking, right? They can do better. So, but then don't, but then don't come on the stage. One second. One second, one second. Don't come. So, I didn't, know, I didn't even know he was here. Otherwise, I would have said something else. <laughs> but I think it's relevant, right? So, when I got in, he, he, he kind of knew that. You know, that's why a lot of times coaches produce the best. A good coach produces amazing players. And those players become better than those coaches. There's only... Uh, according to Imam Ghazali, he says there's only one person on this earth who wants you to be better than him, and that's your father. Right? Your father genuinely wants you to be better than him. But then he says sometimes there are teachers who become like that, who teach you and they want you to become better than them. And that's a very high level of being like you're selfless. You know, you just imagine like you're pushing every time like Roethlisberger is a quarterback on the Steelers, retired now, for example, or Brady was on the Patriots. And this while he's a player and he has an active contract, if the if the team drafts a backup quarterback like Mac Jones or or they, they drafted uh, Garoppolo, the, the starting quarterback will never put the other person under his wing. Like hardly you will do that because, you know, you're preparing him to take your job. But that's not the spirit of Islam. You actually want the other person to be better than you because you know that, and this is a small like nuance, right? When you pray salah, your salah will be judged based on your khushu, your khudu, and based on that, you will get rewarded for it. But if you encourage someone else to pray salah, you will get the full reward of that person's salah, irrespective of how they pray that salah. So it's always in the best interest for you to always be, 
you know, contributing and not taking. And the ones, the greatest people of this earth are the ones who contributed more and not consumed more. So we have to ask ourselves, am I a greater contributor or am I a bigger consumer? Taking, benefiting, taking, or am other people benefiting from me? So my older brother, like, you know, he was extreme, and I'll say it, he was like weak in health. Not like, you know, seven months, nine months. I mean, he took a long time, just put it that way. But guess what? He used to come check my Quran every single day. How much did you do? And he would be rough with me. You did this much? And I, I did like 10 times more than him. I did 10 times more than him. And he would say, you know, you do have to do more. You have to do more. Then I finished Hivd in nine months. And he took like 10 times longer. <laughs> All right. Then, you know, always along the journey, you know, always making sure I'm good. He had so much love, you know, for younger siblings. And he was such a good example in madrasa that you understood why tabi'eens just automatically became good, right? They just saw the sahaba, you know, that's all. Like, I, 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 rem I just, I'm reminded of a poem I mentioned once that even I was at Yaqeen's uh, retreat and I thought of it because they were talking about all these scholars and it's a, Sa'adi, he says, Gile khushbu idar hammami ruze, rasida dasta mahbu badastam, badu guftam ki mushke ya abire, ki azbure dile aweze tu mustam, wa gul, wa gul nashistam ha nashistam, jamale darman akasartam. He says that, he says, Gile khushbu idar hammami ruze. He says, first, he says, I was. I, I walked up to this the soil next to flowers. I picked up the soil, and the soil around the flowers smelled like musk. And I asked the soil, I said, are you musk or are you dirt? And he says, the dirt replied to me, saying that, ma ana illa turab, I'm nothing but dirt. Walakinni sahibtu al-azhar muddatan fa But I spent so much time around flowers that their smell and their fragrance has come inside of me. But at the end of the day, I'm nothing but dirt. So that's the impact that great people have around you, right? That they, they push you forward. They push you forward and they, they, they elevate your level. So my journey, honestly, was my older brother. I, I finished Alam program before him. I became a mufti before him. I remember my teacher telling us when we were kids, he had firasa. He said that, you know, this younger brother of yours is going to become a hafid before you, alim before you, mufti before you, get married before you, and have children before you. So I became hafid before him, became alim before him, became mufti before him. I was going to get married before him. And he said to me, Abdul Rahman, you got to chill. <laughs> right? So he got married one week before me. And then I got married one week after, and I had a son before him. So Umar bin Khattab, anhu. I, I, when I, my, my, and then our youngest brother, Abdul Rahim Khalali, passed away. May Allah grant him Jannah for those. You know, it's just, we, we were so close in the friendship. You know, there's a huge difference between someone like that loves you, that corrects you. Is there a difference? Huge difference. A person who loves you and then corrects you. A person who loves you and encourages you. You know, I have never met someone like they're mentioning all these different names of different people. You know how you said Sheikh Mikhail had someone named yesterday, Ustad Majid had someone, these two people have someone. Well, every time I speak somewhere or do, or do a program, like he will always be the one to put me in place. He will say, you know, Mufti, that was great. And it would not be more than that, right? Mashallah, you know, you people benefited from that. Or he will say, you know, I don't think he ever said anything other than that. He always says that, all right? But the idea is like these people, my older brother in, in this journey, you know, always encouraging, always correct. We're all so close to each other. Because of that, we're able to do more, right? Like you have to, uh, the Sahaba, Umar al-Khattab manhu, when I read this story, it just made me like think about life, man. This, this, he, his brother, these people who are sitting here and, you know, Sheikh Mikhail and all these people come, there are people behind the scenes you'll never, ever hear of. And they have such a huge impact on their life. Imam Abu Hanif Muhammad says that I have never, every single salah, I, every single salah I pray, I make dua 
for my teacher Hamad before I make dua for my father. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal Rahmatullahi, he was told that you got to stop saying your teacher's name Shafi'i, Shafi'i, Shafi'i. And then, because people start, want people want to, people look up to you. So he got up in a khutbah and he says, لَوْلَ الشَّافِعِي مَا فَهِمْتُ آيَةٌ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ if it wasn't for Shafi'i, I would not understand a single verse of the Quran. Right? So Umar al Khattab, we hear his name, we hear his name. And this is something for all of you too. You don't, sitting here, don't aspire that one day I'm going to be sitting here. That's not an aspiration to have. You know, one day I'm going to sit here and be a speaker and I'm going to talk about my journey and tell people. No. There, the, the Prophet has made it clear that actually the safest people on this earth are the ones, al akhfiya that no one knows about, al-atqiyya, al-abrar. You know, when they're in the gathering, no one notices them when they leave. But this is a responsibility. So we have to fulfill that responsibility. Nonetheless, Umar al-Khattab, we all know his story. But in the Battle of Yamama, check this man out, you know. He is looking for the man who impacted his life the most. Right? And we, we can question, you know, who do you think impacted his life the most? Maybe it was his sister, the story we hear about his sister, the Prophet who he was looking for the man who impacted his life the most. And he, he looked through the ones who were alive and he looked toward the ones through who passed away. And when he found the one who he was looking for that he passed away, he screamed, he yelled, and people were so afraid they didn't get close to him. And he put his head in his lap and he wiped away his dirt from his face and wiped the blood from his beard. And you know who that was? That was his older brother. Right? And he said to him, He said, Ya Akhi, laqad sabaqtani marratain, sabaqtani ilal Islam, wa sabaqtani ilal shahada. He says, oh, my brother, you beat me twice. You beat me to Islam, and you beat me to martyrdom. Right? So, that's that's the spirit. Abdullah bin Masulullah, Masul when he when he was uh, crying after his brother passed away, someone came to him and he said to him that, you know, you're such a tough guy, man. You've been through so much in your life. Why are you crying that your brother passed away? And he says, he says, first of all, innahu kan fil nasab. First of all, he's my blood brother. That should make you cry. What kind of heart do you have? Then he said, wasahibi ma rasulullah And he was also my companion with the Prophet We did this together. We were in the trenches together. We were side by side, shoulder to shoulder with the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, But, That he dies and I can seek the reward of sabr is more beloved to me than I would have died and he would have got the reward of sabr. I want the reward of sabr. And I don't mind going through the pain for that reward. So brothers and sisters, my you know, advice to all of us is that we all can have an impact. And my journey basically ends, starts and ends with my older brother, right? Of course, my mother, my father, everyone has a part in it. But when you have someone you can look up to and he can lead you and all of you can do the same thing. As older siblings, as younger siblings, help each other out. Don't be selfish. Don't be a good friend and a bad brother. Don't be an amazing, oh, she's a nice sister, but your own sister and brother don't think like that about you. Right? It takes courage. It takes courage. You know, when Ali said, You are anta ashja'un nas, you know, you are the most courageous person. He says, No. Ashja'uhum man asbar al adha. The most courageous person is the one who is the most patient on people's difficulties and challenges. So be courageous, man. Be patient. It's okay if your younger brother or younger sister talks back to you, is tough with you. No. The love that you, that love that you will feel, you cannot feel that anywhere else. When something happens in life, the strongest shoulders to lean on are your blood brothers and sisters. Doesn't matter how all your friends are going to go back home. All your friends are going to go back home. They all have families, they all have commitments. But the ones who are your brothers and sisters, and may Allah you know, give them a long life, they are the ones who are going to be, when Aydan who came, and I'll conclude with this, when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina Munawwara and he made the ukhuwa between all the Sahaba, someone told Ali when he came, he said, I think that when he, because he came later, he, someone told him that I think the Prophet ﷺ forgot about you because he never made any brotherhood with any uh, Sahabi, Ansari Sahabi. 
So he comes to the Prophet you know, a little down, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, qad akhayta bayna kulli ahad, wa lam tu'akhi bayna bayna ahad. He says, you know, you made this brotherhood between everyone, but you never, how about my brother? And the Prophet looks at him and he says, anta akhi fi dunya wal akhirah. You're my brother. You see how st- strong that statement is? You're my brother. So someone was asking me about this today as well. You know, the brother from overseas, about his, he has a younger sibling. How can he help? Leave this journey, leave this gathering with a renewed relationship with your own siblings. Sibling power is real power, and that's what helped me. And I can guarantee you it's what helped Abdul Wahab, Mufid Wahab, it helped Mu Abdul Aziz. And I know my brother, Abdul Rahim al used to look up to his older brother a lot. And his only thing was he wants to make his older brothers proud. And that's okay. That's also ikhlas. You know, you want to make your older brothers proud for the sake of Allah. Students want to make their teachers proud. So this is my journey and this is my reflections for all of you that you should take back home. Don't just be a good friend. Don't just be a good worker. Just don't be a good you know, principal or a teacher or a doctor or a nurse. That's okay. But if your brother or sister can say, I have the best sister in the world. I have the best brother in the world, and you can impact them and bring them closer to deen, then you know you're on the journey of greatness. Assalamu alaikum. You know, they always place me in the seat facing the women. Why? Astaghfirullah. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum, guys. Um, I didn't know my brother was talking about me. I was like, so which brother are you talking about? <laughs> I did not inspire him at all. Um, but Jazakallah um, khair for your kind words. That's the kindest thing that you ever said. <laughs> these, 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 these people, all you guys are too serious, man. Emotional. Speaking about religion too much. These people are going to walk out. They're going to have to go to Miami after this. Balance their, their faith. So much religious talk. So much in one evening, right? Overdose religion. But overall... I, th- I think they're here for Islam, not Christianity. <laughs> I mean... I think they're here for Islam. Too much emotions, man. I just... y- you know, if you don't stop, we're going to... We're going to turn Dr. Haifa on you right now. <laughs> Doc, Dr. Dr. Haifa <laughs> agrees with me. She's like, these guys are too emotional. Um, let's continue, guys. Um, you know, it's, big, uh, it's a big compliment from you guys, the way you guys are speaking of your teachers, people that influenced you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me half of what you just said. I did not take that long to memorize the Quran. I literally had to come on the stage. I actually came on the stage for that. It, it took him nine months, which... MashaAllah, he has photographic memory, which is not... It took me th- almost four years. No, it was like five. Was no, like five. no, 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 it's, no. I memorized five Jews at 10, five Jews when at 11, then five Jews at 12, and then next 15 the last year. That's 35. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know. I don't know, but he probably got the last five that was gone somewhere. <laughs> yeah. No, five, five. 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 <laughs> yeah. He's counting now. You know, so it, was, um, it wasn't that long, uh, but it was, it was challenging for sure, you know. And it was, I was quite jealous of him. He would mem- he'd look at the Quran for like a few minutes, five pages memorized. What do you do then? Like, you can't beat him up. Just encourage him. <laughs> per- per- pretend like you're proud of him. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, he-, he came into the Quran when I knew two Jews memorized. He started two Jews behind me. I knew Tabarak and Amma. He comes in, falak, falak an nas. He's struggling. Min nafathat. What is this, you know? I'm like correcting him. And a month later, he's on Baqara. And then I'm like, two weeks later, he's on the third juz where I'm at. You know? And I'm like, he's just starting tilka rusul faddalna. And I'm like, just five pages ahead of him. And then we get to the biggest, largest ayah in the Quran. Ayat al-Din. Ya yu al-ladina amanu And that ayah is long. And when you're a new memorizer, long ayats intimidate you, right? When you're revising, small ayats intimidate you. When you're memorizing new, long ayats, like, man, where do I stop, you know? So I had that long ayah over the weekend, or like the next day. He was 
on um, the ayat of infaq, a few pages back, where you're supposed to give charity. And I'm like, there's no way. I, my goal was to finish Baqarah because the next page is the, akhir, the last page of Baqarah. Everyone knows that page because we hear it all the time. So I didn't have to really memorize much. I only had to memorize one page and finish the next page off. I go and read my Quran. I make three mistakes in six lines. I don't know. This, you know, Dane is Dane, you know? It's difficult. <laughs> so I, the teacher st- had a rule. You make three mistakes. It doesn't matter how many pages you memorize. Five pages, ten pages, you stop after six lines. I was hurt. I was like, give me another chance. He's like, nope. No way. I was like, okay. I went to go check on my brother. The guy started three pages behind me, finished Baqarah that day. And then for the rest of my life, I've been chasing you, my friend. You know, still chasing him. But, um, but it is, you know, a lot of people are here. A lot of mothers here, a lot of fathers here. And uh, now we're parents, right, guys? Um, how many kids do you have, Sheikh? Four. MashaAllah, you? Four. Four. Mufti, Mufti and I have the same amount of kids. And, um, and we have three and three. And we're, we're, we're struggling. I, I don't know how our parents did it. You know, let's give a round of applause to our parents. You know, it's... I, I want to teach my kids Quran, you know, the whole focus. You can't go on vacations. You can't go to dinners on Saturday nights or Sunday nights because they have to memorize. They want to learn. They have, you know, it's like basically a kid that's part of a sports club, right? Your whole schedule rotates around that schedule. Like they have soccer, they have hockey. They can't go to programs. They can't travel anywhere else except that schedule. So there's, there's an entire family unit that gets involved. And uh, their families had to do that. And now our generation have to do it. And what I'm looking at here, I'm looking at people who are, I hate to say this, bro, but our parents had to come out of post-colonization. You know, where if someone was going to make their child hafiz or alim, they were going to get criticized. Because secularly, they were still, like, colonized. My parents come from Pakistan, from a very secular background, especially my dad's family. When I met my, my dad's elder sister first time in my life, she's a physician in Islamabad, Old, old elder sister, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm eighth grade memorizing Quran. He's like, you're wasting your life. Mm. Right? So there was like, it was, it was a very negative thing. Like, you went all the way to America, your dad's a physician, now he's wasting your life. You know? So we, my parents and our parents, who migrated from Palestine, India, Pakistan, even Syria, they were colonized by the British and the French. So when they thought about religion, they had a lot, there was... They had to battle a lot of these cultural battles. Today, look at us. Look at what we're doing. Like, there's nothing but encouragement. Am I right or wrong, guys? Yeah. It's not the same battle anymore. And now, like, we're talking about, I know sisters here that come to me and like, man, Sheikh Abdullah, I want to be like your mother. My mother had, couldn't say that to, about anyone because she was doing it and everyone was against her. The community was against her. And Arbor was against her. Like, people were not as supportive. Some people were. So it's very important that we see where we are now. We're at one of the best situations in our life. There's so many people doing it, and now they're also leading the path of secular education, where a sheikh is now doing his PhD degree, where now a sheikh is becoming an engineer, correct? And you're becoming a doctor. You are a doctor. Today, you don't know I what happened. Tell him the story. <laughs> you told him Dr. Zakir Naik? <laughs> see, the thing is, this is my problem, my brothers and all you guys. They, they're not funny. And they use me as comedy. <laughs> use your own script. Have your own, like, fresh content. Sheikh Abdulaziz, he called me the four jokes in the speech. My brother, by down, blah, blah, blah. Just, just be natural. Just be natural. You know? You know? So I had some people in Umrah with me. And you know how you walk out from Medina? People trying to sell you dates. People come up there trying to ask you questions. And I had, I had it. You know, like, khalas. I was doing too much salawat. My brain went dry. Salawat, salawat. You know, like, you know when you do too much dhikr? You, you go, you, your brain gets dry. You guys don't know what I'm talking about. We're, we're, not, we're, not, we're, not as pi- we're not as pious as you yeah, yet. No, you don't level. So, do so you get, go through this dryness. So I'm walking out of Haram, and this uh, guy comes up to me. He's like, Ajwa, Ajwa, Ajwa. Ajwa, right? I'm like, so he's, he sounds like, Ajwa, 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 right? So my reply will go back. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the four or five people next to me are like, what? That's hilarious. Where did you come up with that? I was like, if he doesn't understand my language, he's not going to ask me again. <laughs> and I just walked away. <laughs> so it was hilarious. So my, my brothers, you guys, are, well, you guys are laughing like you haven't laughed in a long time. I'm sorry you guys are bored here. But 
But the reality is, but, 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 don't but, but, relax. Why'd you tell them that joke? That was amazing. The guy came up to me, he called me Zakir Naik. <laughs> 20 minutes after Sheikh Abdulaziz's speech, like, where is this guy? <laughs> 2020 vision needs to be checked. But the reality, you know, the reality is, like, we're very fortunate. Look at what, where we're sitting. In your communities now, you have imams that know English. You know, you have Zoom access. I know so many people are learning Quran online. What answer do you have to Allah now that I didn't have an opportunity? You know, these, ki- these young men who were kids at one time traveled to Medina, Karachi. I don't know how your mom sent you to Karachi and how your mom sent you to Medina. And I don't know how your mom sent you to Karachi. It's, it's difficult. You know, um, we were five, you know, we were five brothers and all five of us were away from home for 10 years. It got so lonely at my mom's house I had to buy a cat. <laughs> Correct? And... Um, when my mom sent the fifth brother, Abdurrahim Rahmatullahi, I say this story all the time. You didn't share this story? I say this story all the time. And really, it's fathers, I, I'm going to look at you a little bit, but you know, but really, it all comes down to the mother. You know, as a male saying this, it's like I'm not trying to be a misogynist, I'm just trying to be a realist. Like, this is, this is like a, 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 a great father with an average wife doesn't cut it, but a great mother with a horrible husband still cuts it. And, and I was very careful saying this because I don't want to get canceled. <laughs> no, Sheikh Abdullah, Sheikh Abdullah, everyone knows. He's the only scholar on this earth who's don't, uncancelable. Don't say that. He cannot cancel don't, him. Don't say that. You're going to get Ain. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. Man. Like, it's not true. May Allah save us. I, mean, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. I just don't know if you could say that in California. California. <laughs> when I go to California, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the media is going to come and say, can you please interview? <laughs> Translation, please. My brother was saying women are great. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> you guys are laughing way too much. It's not that funny, guys. Let's focus. Let's focus. Because you guys are losing focus. It's late. So after a certain time, I start acting a little bit different, too. Excited. So uh, my mom was um, ironing with... What my mom would do, and I'm saying this for the sisters and the, fa- and the mothers and the fathers, my mom would iron, we would, pa- would we would pack up our bags, because we're horrible children. She would iron our suit, our, all of our clothes, say 20 pairs, and she knows that we're going to wear them in two weeks, they're going to be bad again, but she would iron them. All of our pairs, for f- you know, for, tw- for f- five sons, you know, like, like a lot of, lot, of, lot of work, our, our bags, and we just get up in the morning and leave on the rides. And uh, when she was ironing one pair, I remember watching her very clearly. Um, and I saw moisture on the cloth. And I, and I was like, man, is that the steam of the iron? And I looked closer, and her eyes were dripping. Mm. You know, tears were just flowing. And I never saw my mom cry. You know, she's such a strong woman around us. MashaAllah, she doesn't show weakness in front of her kids. I'm sure she cries when she's praying and stuff. I saw those tears dripping. And I'm like, I'm 20 years old, and my youngest brother is 10 years old. So I go to my mom, and I say, Mom, are you actually crying? Like, why? She said, you know, when I sent you 10 years ago, there were three, four more brothers of yours at home. Abdurrahim was born the year, the few years after I went to the boarding school. So there was three that Abdurrahim was born. I had other children, and I was a little younger. Now I'm sending all of you. I have no one home, Mm. and I'm a little older, you know? So it's difficult. Those tears are the foundation of Miftah. Those tears are the foundation of the fruits of these teachers here, of our parents. You know, and these are struggles that we have to make when the world is going to, you know, it's going to look at this and, you know, this is a big, I mean, I don't, sometimes I think like as scholars at IOK, you guys are not doing something small. You guys are going against the tide. Everyone can flow with the wave. And some can stop the wave. Can you go against the current? Imagine swimming against the current uphill, you know? Uh, you know, not down river, up the river. So this is so difficult and really goes down to the parents, the, their crying, their tears, their struggles. And when I was in Umrah, I said to my final uh, speech in Umrah to my group, I said, I know we're looking at Mina, we're looking at Safa Marwa, 
Sorry, Mufti, I'm speaking so much. No worries. You do all the writing, I do all the speaking. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know? He, um, he, I looked at Safa Marwa, and I said, this nation was built by a woman. Mm. This whole Makkah, I know Ibrahim comes and takes a knife, wants to sacrifice a child, right? But he's doing all that on the back of his wife. No child would say, do what Allah has told you to do if the mother didn't raise that child that way. If you focus on the word where Ibrahim says, You know, I saw in my dream that I'm ordered to sacrifice you. And you tell me what you think. You know, my dad broke this ayah down for me and he read this in Tafsir Uthman. He said, why is Ibrahim saying, Is it possible that his son might say no? So Ibrahim might, you know, well, let's have a second option. Ibrahim is saying, I want your opinion. So based, I'm going to gauge the way you respond. If you say no, I have another uh, like, uh, like line of action. I'm going to have to tie you down then. Right? And if you say yes, I know how to, like, I'm not going to disobey God. It's going to happen. Whatever God's told me is going to happen. So I want to know. So a lot of parents sometimes have to understand the child's psychology. Sometimes you're yelling at your child for something he's ready to do. <laughs> right? And, and the way you're doing it, he's just discouraged even more. So it's always good to check their pulse. You talk to your spouse like, well, I, I, want, I want to go there, I want to go there. And the wife is like, I want to go too. <laughs> and you just start an argument. Some, some men really have no life, they like arguing. That's a form of encouragement for them. But, but the reality, you know, so this, he fundur ma tara. Like, what's your opinion? He says, if al ma tu'ma. So he doesn't tell his dad, fathbahni. Because that's what he's saying. So do whatever you've been commanded. If it's this, if it's this. What, where does this answer come from? Hajar. Where does the Zamzam come from? Hajar. Where does Safa Marwa come from? Hajar. And then Ibrahim builds this structure where no one's around, only Ismail and Hajar. Salam. Ibrahim, Allah calls this family, this person, Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan. He was an entire nation. Built on the back of Hajar. You know, the, 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 the rubbing of the feet of Ismail is, a, is Zamzam. No, no cameras, no, no referees, no, no emperor. No one was watching Hajar run and then walk. No one saw this. Allah saw it. All men mimic her today. So this is what I say to the mothers who are here, honestly, and the fathers, please support, you know, the families, you know, it's, it's big. You guys are responsible. We're all responsible for the future of America and Islam in this country. If 10 mothers make a decision that we're going to make few of our children scholars, few of our children serve the deen at a, at a leadership level, your state will flip. It will not become red or blue. It will become all green. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, I'm not, not, I'm not saying green like the dome, but just like it will become, become lively. Don't take the colors. Of the say green like Detroit, the cannabis here? No, no, no. Like, not the cannabis. This is when a guy who's not funny tries to be funny. <laughs> yeah. You know? What do you say green for? I mean, green you like it will be fresh. You meant the are going to become green. It will be, be, oh, no. be fresh. <laughs> you know, it will be like lively. You will see so much, like, you know, money is green because it's, you know, you'll become, <laughs> it'll become, it'll change the whole atmosphere. Everywhere we go to give programs, lectures, call, talks, people say, please send in one of your students. I say, out of th three, like 20,000 Muslims, send us one child. Mm. Send us one dog. And, and just like there's a need in the brothers to guide the community, sisters, we don't have enough mentorship. With Dr. Haifa here, please give a round of applause, guys. You know, Sister Zainab Ansari, uh, Dr. Tasneem Akik, these sisters, we need more sisters to be role models. Not just speakers, examples. We can't just be speakers, we need to be on the ground with them. Mufti Abdul Rahman and these shiukh who are sitting here, they're on the ground with their students. You know, I'm so happy that we have female instructors coming to Miftah so the sisters can hang out with them. There was a time that the sisters had to wait two hours to speak to a male scholar. And then the male scholar, has no idea what the sister is going through. Excuse me, what are you talking about? You know? 
So it's still, yeah, we're, we're still understand what's going on, but no one understands women issues better than a woman. We need women in this field. We need women counselors, youth directors, leadership roles, scholars. And that's what we need in our community. Don't wait for the next generation. We are the generation. So the... No, uh, you know, I get very excited when people clap for me. <laughs> like, so, something happens, like, I guess there's a drill, and I go, wow. <laughs> go ahead. Let's, let's call it. You guys... We're at 16 minutes up. We'll just get Sheikh Farhan's final um, remarks. You guys didn't let him speak the whole time? He did, he did, he did. <laughs> did let the, let's, let's just see the um, final feedback and comments for the audience if you can head on, inshallah. Sheikh Farhan on the screen looks so cute, mashallah. Wow, right. You know, like, I'm, like, may Allah reward you. you you've been so, so much... Why, why do you say that on the screen and not here? <laughs> There's a couple of reasons. I don't like to publicize it. Okay. But of course, the camera helps. Shut <laughs> up, Sheikh Farhan, I don't know what question you asked him earlier, but how the heck did you write all these books, mashallah? He's, this man is so young, mashallah, and I read his books and I teach with his books. You know, Quran, Tafsir, uh, Usul of the Sciences of Hadith, Science of Quran, and so many books. And can I see your fingers, mashallah? You know, do you type or write? Type. Type, mashallah. Inshallah. I don't, I don't know how to type, by the way. You don't know how to type? So you struggle? You do that? Like, I know some people that type like the nose, <laughs> you know, but, um, but it is, you know, today, today I witnessed the barakah, some of the barakah, or some of the mu'ajizat of Sheikh Farhan. You, he has mu'ajizat? <laughs> oh, yeah. Today, I saw, I saw today some of the karamat of his hands. Wow. Right? Because I was uh, trying to figure flight. out the same thing. How does he write so much? So much, yeah. And subhanAllah, we were on this red-eye flight, and I couldn't, I could not fall asleep for the life of me. And Sheikh Farhan was knocked out, like he was out, cold, <laughs> subhanAllah, right? And all of a sudden, in the middle of the flight, <laughs> he wakes up, <laughs> his kufi falls off. It just falls off. He just catches it <laughs> <laughs> in his sleep. <laughs> I look, I was like, Samana <laughs> wa I was like, I'm in. <laughs> how, do you, how did you get the time? Like, mashallah, you're like, it's karama. No. Honestly, I try to write a, like, a small, small, I'm doing one book, one project, it's two years, man. It's like, it takes forever, you know? And I have so many people helping me, you know? Uh, Sundu Suleiman, Dana Suleiman, mashallah, you know, these people who are in my, in my Miftah students. How do you really take out the time in Baraka to publish these, all these books, mashallah? Round of applause for Sheikh Farhan. No, well, I, it's, it's, it's the tawfiq of Allah, nothing else. It's just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives tawfiq. And a lot of credit to my, my wife and children. They give, they give me here? space. No. She listening? <laughs> no. Wow, you're a very lovely she, guy. She, refu she, refuses to, <laughs> she refuses to listen to my lectures. <laughs> uh, you know why he's laughing so loud? His wife is the same thing, probably. <laughs> you know? My wife was like, you sound more religious than you are, obviously. <laughs> I'm talking about the prophet, not myself. <laughs> what kind of statement is that? You sound more religious than you are. I'm like... The only person that sounded equally as religious was the Prophet <laughs> and the Sahaba, you know, like, except for Mufti Sahab, you know. Sorry, go ahead. So, alhamdulillah, the, the, my, my wife gives me time in the evening, at least, like, um, you know, after she, all the kids go to sleep, says, you can have your time to write. Wow. Then, uh, See? Again, another woman. Yeah. Give a round of applause for her. <laughs> I, Mufti Sahab, I know your wife is here. She has very little share in your contribution in your life. <laughs> You know, but you're blessed, you know. <laughs> he, he can't even believe I said that. You know, the thing is, being the older brother, I just love enjoying. I enjoy this. You know, I thank God for making your old, older brother because it humbles you and it inflates me. But reality is, you didn't even finish. Like, so what do you do? You just said, oh, my wife has me. No, like, you're so humble. Like, please, say some more. That's it. That's it? That's, it. That's not fair. Like, how many hours a day and what books are you working on? Uh -huh. What have you written about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, these guys. That's another problem with shiyukh. They're way too sincere. I thought about that. You know, mashallah, they need to tell, we need to know your work. How are we going to benefit? If I did one, like, one article, publish it everywhere, put it on the highway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's go. Baraka, baraka. He's Te just teacher, giving me baraka. Teacher's du'as. Teacher's du'as. Teacher's du'as. Teacher's du'as. Honestly, I'm not vibing with this guy. He is, he's so sincere. You know, mashallah. First he said, tawfiq, right? 
Then he said his wife, mashallah. Then the sheikh said, Baraka, what are you working on right now? There's a couple works. One is, uh, I'm continuing with the tafsir works. You're writing a tafsir book? Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Surah Al-Anbiya. And Sirah? No, no Sirah yet. What else? Surah Al-Anbiya. Surah Al-Anbiya tafsir? And, and, and the book that's being edited right now, inshallah, published soon is the, a brief introduction to the Hanfi Madhab. So the, the history and development. Round of applause. <laughs> Sheikh, you deal with this person like this all the time? MashaAllah, honestly, uh, these are the type of people that keep our society alive. You know, may Allah bless Sheikh Farhan, his wife, his children, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the institution, IOK, inshallah, Sheikh Nu'man there, Sheikh Ahmed. Um, you know, I didn't get to know you well, Sheikh Ahmed, I heard a lot about you, I heard you speak about it earlier, and you made some jokes on me and Mufti Bahab. You know, what the problem is, I can't say anything to you, because you're older than me. He's older than me too, but you know, there's the fact that you came all the way here, and you're from California. You give us your weekend, your time. We're so grateful. You know, we love you. You're, you guys are at least 20 years older than us, both of you guys. <laughs> what are you guys, five? I mean, no. What are you? I mean, you guys, you guys are at least 55. You know, you can't. You guys, you know, it's hard to tell because you guys dye your hair well. You, you do a good job, you know? You wear, you know, you, you wear black clothes, and then you dye black. You look, you look, you look 25, you know? You know, and these guys are senior to us, and they're so kind to sit with us. Mm -hmm. Honestly, they were back in the circuit of working where we're still studying, you know, and they uh, accepted the juniors' invite to come to Miftah. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Our honor, pleasure, man. Barakallah, Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.